Thanks for downloading this episode from Teachers Talk Radio. You can find the full schedule and listen back to all our shows at ttradio.org. Enjoy the podcast. This programme has been brought to you by The Happy Confident Company. Our clinically approved, ready-to-go wellbeing and mental health programme will help your pupils thrive. In only 10 minutes a day, you'll be able to deliver social and emotional learning and well-being tools throughout your school. To find out more, visit us at www.happyconfident.com. Right, I've now got um, Siobhan. Siobhan, good evening. How are you? You can unmute yourself, bottom left, hopefully. What a rookie error. Good evening. Thanks for having me on. Good evening. And, And how are you today? Yeah, very well, thanks. How are you? Not too bad, not too bad. Um, it, I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Um, and I'm sure, Nathan, I'm going to ask my wonderful administrator if you can change the title of the, the show to relate what we're going to talk about, which is, should teachers take... The, I, I, I was going to make the question, because I'm sort of going along with some of the stuff you've said, Shivan. Should teachers ever take strike action? I think that that would be a nice question to start with. So I'll ask you that question to start with. Should teachers ever take strike action? Oh, that's an easy, that's an easy one. You're ever, yes. In this particular context, no. But in in, in a wider context than yes, I I think they should. I'm not anti-industrial action in principle. Right. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna sort of dig into this, and and again, we've got Alex and also we've got June, who are both gonna come on. Hopefully, um, Nathan, I might ask you to just maybe DM Alex and June. I have sent invites to both, so if you just check your screens, there should be a there should be a an invite there that says that you can accept to become a, a speaker. Uh, but in the meantime, Shivan, I just want to ask you. You wrote a thread about the strike action. Now I'm gonna read some of this thread. So you started off by saying, I'm a teacher. Um, you're an English teacher, right? I'm, yeah, I'm an English teacher. I'm deputy curriculum lead at my school. And I'm responsible for Key Stage 5. Great. OK. Now, you, you've written this thread and it says, I'm a teacher. Here's why I'm against the teacher strike. And I started off by saying, number one, I think that further disruption to children's education is wrong. It will take you years to recover from the impact of school closures. Um, you then move on. You say inflation is still worryingly high. The NEU's instructions for teachers to keep heads in the dark over whether or not they intend to strike is a safeguarding issue. The UK economy is forecast to shrink. A lot of schools did not offer much in the way of education during the first lockdown. Interesting one, Sharon. We'll come back to that. The government has raised teachers' salaries to 30 k Government has given schools an extra two billion. Uh, the NEU uh, pushed for longer school closures, and there's some of the reasons. But I wondered whether you could sort of like, where do your objections to the? T- I know you've highlighted the reasons there, but where do your, your where do your objections to teachers going on strike at the moment come from? Do they come from just the, you know what you're seeing, or is it is it deeper than that? Um, no, I think the main the main issue would be my opinion about the impact of the school closures um and how i feel like there's sort of a kind of short-term memory problem with the fact that you know in the profession we're dealing with a particular a particular cohort who have suffered from an unprecedented level of disruptions they're learning and i feel like that should be our priority kind of nationally for the next few years It's, it's a huge undertaking and a huge amount of loss to recover from. Um, and it's created all of these kind of subsequent issues. So there's an issue with pers- persistent absence. There's an issue with um, students who just haven't come back to school post lockdown. Um, you've obviously got the problem with kind of increased anxiety around public examinations, particularly for year 11, year 11 and 13, having not had, had, had to sit them uh, before. So I think for me, the, my main issue and my main reason against the strikes would be down to the school closures um all the other issues that i kind of you mentioned in, in in my thread from a couple of months ago i still kind of i stand by most of them i think the inflation one is kind of more more debatable now um but for the most part i think you know there, there has been in my opinion a bit too much kind of group consensus on this um and i do feel like the neu in particular 
have slight, somewhat misled their members um, when they've balloted. Um, so no, it's a How... kind of broader, broader picture. I don't, I don't disagree with industrial action in principle. Um, I don't object or disagree with the fact that teachers have faced real-term pay cuts over the last uh, 10, 14 years. Um, I just think in the context that we're currently operating in, which is huge amounts of le- lost learning to COVID, and, and the, as I said before, the kind of um, other factors that come in, come in as a result of that, it's not the right time to go on strike. I mean, I just want to dig into. I mean, what what was it about the NEU ballot out of interest that you sort of thought was misleading? Yeah. I think well, I, I think the kind of the, the, well, the, the, the office for statistical regulation have come back to the NEU about this idea that of the government not fully funding. We can get we can get into the nitty gritty of this if you'd like. Um, that kind of fully funding uh, kind of nugget has become a real wedge in terms of. I think there was teacher teacher tap. Uh, surveyed their surveyed their users, and the majority of teachers said that they they would actually not go on strike uh, had the offer been fully funded. Um, and the OSR have come back and said, look, that that use of that term, fully funded, that when the, when the DFE used that in their pay offer, they were being sincere and they they were they were using it in application to the schools at a national average level, not individual schools. So I think that's kind of been that that kind of part of the offer has been misconstrued by the NEU um, and, it's, and frankly like especially and I'm, I'm being really careful not to hammer other unions but I really don't think that the other three unions are radical in any way I think they're quite moderate but I think the NEU are quite radical I think they they are using this as an opportunity to kind of bash the Tories um, which I disagree with I don't think we, I mean much as I don't approve of much of the government's actions I don't think politicising this issue and 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 you know causing kids to be collateral damage is the right method either yeah um <laughs> but but that's the the question sort of still remains in terms of why was the neu ballot misleading like i said i think the, i think the, the way in which they so, so first said so misleading might be the wrong word i think the, the way that they 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 went for above inflation pay rises um i think they need to explain that you know explain the economic economic circumstances to their members, because I mean, to ask, in my opinion, to ask an above inflation inflation pay rise is is just not a very likely scenario. Um, and then combined with the fact that they really did hammer home this kind of fully funded argument, um, to me that they, I don't know if they're operating in good faith or negotiating in good faith. I don't think that of the other unions, though. I do think other unions are more moderate, as I said before. Um, we'll bring Alex in. Alex, I th- I'm not sure what union you're a member of, Alex. Um, but I don't know whether you have any thoughts on that. Uh, I'm in the NEU, Tom. Um, which specific bit did you want the thoughts on? On whether you think the ballot... Well, a few things, actually. Whether you think the ballot was... Mis- was was Well, I, I know Siobhan sort of like corrected that terminology, but was in any way misleading towards members. Whether you think the NEU are using this as an excuse to bash, in inverted commas, bash the Tories... Um, and whether you think the NEU is um, more radical in a negative sense than the other unions. Mm. Um, There's quite a lot of points there. I'll I'll try and do them sort of one by one, and and please remind me if I miss any. Um, I'll start with the NEU being uh, radical and using this as an opportunity. I would say that the way that we can tell that's not the case uh, is the fact that we've got a historic moment here where we've got the NAU, the NASWA, the ASCL and the NAHT all singing from one hymn sheet and all condemning the pay offer and all balloting for renewed strike action. That's not happened before um, and that's quite an extreme circumstance. So the fact that there's mass agreement across all of the major education unions, including the ones that represent school leaders, um, I would say that kind of shows that it's not the the NAU trying to be uh, politically opportunistic. Um, as to whether they were misleading, I, I think I know the point that Siobhan is trying to make, which is um, the issue of whether or not it was fully funded. Uh, this is quite a knotty issue. Um, overall, the point is, can individual schools actually fund the below inflation pay rise to so the pay cut? Can they even fund that without making cuts to their budget? Um, the answer appears to be no. Um, so the estimate of our unions is that 70% uh, 
uh, of individual schools won't be able to do that. That's because of a kind of combination of things. Uh, one would be that wider children's services over the last uh, decade or so have been cut by around 20%. So that's things like early intervention programs. Obviously, people will be aware of cuts to CAMs, things like that. And so schools are increasingly having to try to um, bridge themselves over that gap and provide that sort of service. Another thing would be rising energy prices um, that have come through, obviously, as a result of the last couple of years, but with no additional funding from government. So the question is, could schools viably provide that below inflation pay rise? Again, it's a cut, it's not a rise, but could they even provide that without making uh, cuts elsewhere? Uh, and the answer seems to be, no, they can't. So in the NAHT, they did a survey of their uh, head teacher members, and 92% of them said that they don't have the headroom in the budget to afford even that miserable offer uh, that the government made. So um, this is not a coincidence, you know, that we've got these four unions and that we've got school leaders speaking as one, saying that they cannot afford it. Uh, they're not being dishonest. Can I, I, can, I wait... can I hop in on the... the um, so so you're, you're quoting the NEU figures. The IFS have said it's affordable <laughs> average. So... So I, 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 I see your point that there will be, there will be individual schools that, that will ha have budgetary pressures and won't be able mm. to afford the pay rise. But on average, schools will be able to because funding is now catching up. It's, it's, for, for the next academic year, it will be higher than costs are. You mentioned high energy prices, but energy prices are going to fall. So I think that, you know, again, I think that offer has been slightly mischaracterized. And I think it is worth going into the knotty details. Because I think even from, from speaking to colleagues, there's a kind of general... So, slight misunderstanding about the pay offer and, and and you know you hear words like it was insulting it was derogatory uh so five percent in september then they offered the 1000 non-consolidated payment um was that in march I, i've lost track of when that was which would have which would have been about two, two to three percent of the average salary on top of the five percent um and that was fully funded that part of the offer the the independent review body for september of the of next year then recommended a 3.5% pay increase, um, and the government offered 4.5%. Of that 1%, and this is getting into, I said it'll be naughty, of that 1%, that part, half of it, the government's funding through grants. I think, I think that's 150 million, and there's 150 million left that they're not funding. So it's actually quite a small part of the overall picture that has become, in a way, the kind of the focal point of the whole debate. Um, and as to whether or not you keep using this idea of pay cuts, but I, I just think, I, and, and in real terms, teachers' pay is being, I'm not disagreeing with that, but I, I do think when we have inflation at the levels we were seeing, uh, persistently high and, and double digit until recently, and when we have the, project, uh, the growth projections that we have as a country and the likelihood of, of a recession, really high interest rates, all department budgets are stretched. And I think the biggest criticism I can make of the government would be that the, the the years of austerity were a huge mistake because they are now essentially the kind of cow, the, 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 the hens are coming home to roost in a sense they, they underfunded schools for such a long time and they're only just catching up in terms of funding back to what it was like in 2010 so i'm not disagreeing with the fact that schools are have suffered but i'm thinking in the here and now in regards to the state of the economy and in regards to the offer that was made I think, in my, and I know I'm in a, in a minority position, I think the teachers should have taken that offer. I think the, I think the NU should have recommended that they take the offer. And I, I appreciate that would have left uh, you know, some schools, and I, I dispute the number, but some of those schools, individual schools who couldn't afford it, in a situation where they would have to make really difficult decisions. Whether or not there would have been a, there would have been a way for the, for the NUs, not the NU, rather, whether or not there'd be a way for, for schools to appeal for government help, or uh, you know, whether there'll be a way of... Um, targeting interventions i don't know that's not i'm not i'm not a policy expert but I, I think that's kind of it's worth bearing in mind that bigger picture when we're talking about this issue mm. Alex, um, the, the, yeah it's all right to come back on that yeah, go, go on. Yeah, of course. yeah um the point is they're they're not going to listen um obviously we'd like to resolve this in a way that doesn't involve strike action uh nobody enjoys disrupting the education uh, of children and I, I totally share what you said at the start of this, Shaban, and what you've said before about the impact of the pandemic, uh, not just on academic outcomes. For me, I, I would say primarily the social and emotional impacts uh, of the loss of school time as well. 
And I'm desperate to avoid that happening. But um, the problem is that they've given no sign whatsoever uh, that they will listen to any rational appeals from the profession. I mean, I'll give you an example from pre-pandemic. My own school had to shut uh, early on a Thursday afternoon every every week for a year uh, because we were underfunded to that level. Now, we can we can kind of go around the houses on getting right into the nitty gritty, as you say. Um, the, the practical reality is the school was forced to do that in order to keep the lights on. So it is, it's a live reality that schools were going through even before this situation began and the government was not listening. Um, what, they've barely, you, what, they've barely even... About, sorry, sorry, yeah. sorry, do you mind if I just finish on this? Yeah, sorry. They've, they've barely even shown a willingness um, to negotiate until the strike action took place. Then we got uh, the, the measly offer of the 1,000, which is at least some movement and there's some negotiation from the government. Um, but only because we've played hardball. Uh, that, that's the sad reality that we've been kind of forced to. Um, I just want to read, and, and then I'll let you come back in, Siobhan. I just want to read um, something that Jeff Barton said, uh, the secretary of the ASCL. Um, if it's okay, I'll just read the quote. So he said this to his that. members. Um, it is my responsibility to be completely honest with you. The truth of the matter is that industrial action is the only route that is now available to us. I never dreamt that I would ever be saying this to you. But then again, I doubt you ever dreamt you would be in this position either, or that the pressures on the education system and the neglect and complacency of the government would bring us to this dismal, squalid state of affairs. Now, that's quite something, isn't it? They've never done this before, uh, and he's felt moved to say that uh, and to ballot his members for strike action. Um, th this is a crisis that we're in. You know, we missed our recruitment target by 41% this year, and one third of teachers have left the profession that qualified in the last 10 years. All the people that you and I are concerned about, Siobhan, all the cohort that are in school at the moment, are going to lose out uh, if we don't arrest this state of affairs because people will leave uh, and they won't be replaced. And that's going to steadily drive the standards of schools into the ground and they won't get those consistent relationships and that steadiness and stability uh, that we know that they need. This programme has been brought to you by The Happy Confident Company. Our clinically approved, ready-to-go, well-being and mental health programme will help your pupils thrive. In only 10 minutes a day, you'll be able to deliver social and emotional learning and well-being tools throughout your school. To find out more, visit us at www.happyconfident.com. <laughs> um, give you a chance to sort of respond. To that. No, that's, that's fine. I, I, sorry to interrupt you, Alex. I, I, did, I thought you'd finish. Um, so I don't accept the fact that strikes are just more disruption on top of on top of the disruptions already taking place i think there's been five days of strikes already from the neu um and those days of strikes are on i think you have to remember that's on top of the the time that they've missed from covid i don't think you can separate the two um i i, I have a lot of respect for jeff barton but i personally think he's making a huge mistake in 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 um balloting i think i think the optics of senior leaders and head teachers going on strike will be terrible i mean the average salary for head teachers in the high 60,000s. i know that they're going to say it's about funding but um inflation is really unfair and it's particularly unfair on poor people and it's unfair on the, on, on the poorest students that we serve they're having to pay more on energy they're having to pay more on food um teachers to some extent are kind of insulated in the, in the sense that the, although real terms pay has fallen we have a, a fairly good average salary we also have a really, 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 really generous pension, which I don't think is spoken about enough at all. Like the teacher pension is, you know, unbelievably rare nowadays. The defined um, benefits pension, um, it's much larger than than private sector workers can enjoy. For the most part, I think only three percent of private sector workers have a defined benefits pension. Um, so I do think that the, but the optics of this mass industrial strike and coordinated strike in September will not be very good. I think parents will, I think parents will be starting to lose support if not if they haven't already, uh, because it will look like, I think, I think it will look like a kind of class war in the sense that this is a middle class profession using students. And I'm not saying teachers are doing this. I'm saying the union members are, but you, uh, the union leaders are using students as collateral damage to get you know a higher level of pay i'm not saying they shouldn't get the higher level of pay but i think the way that they're doing it that approach is not right given the impact of of, of the pandemic and the strikes that have really happened shivan I, i'm going to come in with it with a Go question on. for you now is is channel 4 news ran a story of, i don't know whether you saw it a few weeks back and they sort of highlighted a lot of the issues so 
uh, teacher vacancies, uh, I think Alex already mentioned this, are, you know, the highest they've been since, well, probably records began. Like, it's ridiculous. Um, you've there's got... A proje- there's a project- the projected ones, right? The ones that they're, they're not... No, no, no. This is this is going back to 2010. So right. um, this, is, this is the number of vacancies for jobs currently is, I think, four times, maybe more than that, what it was in 2010. So that's the number of te- current teacher vacancies there are. If you go on to, you know, um, sort of job engines, I'm not going to yeah. name them, but no, some no. of the more popular ones, there are literally like 12,000, 15,000 jobs there. Yeah. But and do you think no that's generally down to pay? Do you think that's all down to pay? I mean, no, no. You know what my views on this are, yeah. I I don't believe that it's all down to pay. And in fact, I don't even necessarily believe that the pay is a more than 50 percent reason for it but i do think that it would help and i think anything that would help this situation is a good thing because i think i think that's my personal view by the way but i mean what would you say to the fact that we are in that place where there are not enough teachers coming in and obviously if you're a t- if you're somebody who's considering entering a profession one of the key things that you do look at is pay and terms and conditions and i did see another graphic the the real pay decreases that teachers have experienced is actually the i think it, i think it was the worst in the public sector compared to yeah it's 10 percent, i think or 12 percent. well well it was it was comparing all the different professions within the public sector over the last 15 years or whatever and teachers came out worse out of them all in terms of I the think, real yeah, pay, pay. I think that's particularly in the in true of um experienced teachers i think uh, the the pay for first um trainees at ects is now isn't is that's not the case but for experienced teachers they have suffered the most well, maybe as of September, because I know they've they've changed it to thirty thousand starting starting yeah, salary. Yeah. But you know, but then when you throw in all the sort of um, the 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 conditions of work that go with that, um, it's a pretty it's a pretty dynamic uh, part once you put it all together. So what I'm I'm saying to you is, at what point would you actually say that strike action was okay? Because we are in a position where, as you've just acknowledged. The pay that teachers have, have got is the worst that it's been, the worst compared to other public sector services based on real pay increases. We have the most teacher vacancies four times, maybe more than that. What we had in 2010 in terms of teacher vacancies that need filling. We've got uh, what else have we got here? Uh, we've got one of the worst rates pupils per teacher. Uh, and in fact, the pupils per teacher rate. Uh, has gone up in the last sort of four or five. We are right uh, up towards the the top end on that. We're way above the OECD average in terms of the secondary pupils per teacher. So we need more teachers. So what? So if you're saying you don't want to strike, when is it? When is it that you would say that it was okay to strike? But, but that's not the question. That, that, that question is, is I have to, I'm not having a go at you at all. But I just think it's slightly disingenuous because you have to deal with the offer that was made, right? And I think the offer that was made has been uncharacteristically described as unfair and derogatory and insulting. And it isn't. I mean, I think when you look at the economic situation of the country um, and you look at other factors that teachers enjoy, so for example, the pensions I mentioned earlier, um, it I just don't think it is as bad as people are painting it to be. So if, if the government hadn't offered anything, then maybe I would have a different view on strikes and, and on taking industrial action. But the fact is that the the, the, the um, pay offer that was made, I think, was actually quite reasonable given the wider economic uh, circumstances. Um, going back to what you said about the, the, the fact that we have been missing our teacher targets, I, I, I'm like you, I don't necessarily think it's all down to pay. I think, for example, £30,000 as a starting salary, I, I think it's pretty good. Again, especially when you look at other sectors. Mm. Uh, and then you have to think about, well, what is causing teachers to leave? And for the most part, this is what I mentioned on Newsnight, I don't think a lot of the issues in teaching are actually down to government. I would say they're down to school leaders. Uh, I would say it's down to behaviour. So it's down to the work-life balance and bureaucracy all of those conditions are created by school leaders and by by um you know by by, by schools themselves not necessarily by government if the government was to offer us a, a really genuine um you know 
working partnership with teachers in, t- in terms of looking at how we can source out work-life balance issues, looking at how we can reduce admin, which is what the government was saying, but I think that was, I, I kind of agree, it was slightly hollow. But I think that alongside the offer, I think it, it wasn't, I don't think that it was as a bad an offer as, as has been uh, stated. And I don't think that, you know, at the moment we have this kind of weirdly skewed pay scale where actually the, at the start of your career, the pay is pretty generous now. It's the more experienced teachers who've suffered um, in terms of real terms pay cuts. And frankly, what I would say about that is it's obviously unfair and it has to be addressed. But I think it has to be addressed when the economic circumstances are better. At the moment, they're pretty dire. And the government, you know, I know these might be these things sound like kind of nebulous when you talk about one, two percent figures. But if you think about how if the government increased teacher salary two percent more than than any of asked for that also f- feeds into your pension schemes which are incredibly expensive as well so it's not it's i, I see it as the government the, the, the department of education have this pot of money that they're trying to get, get as far as they can and i i also think this is kind of slightly going on a tangent but i think it's also worth thinking about would this be happening and and i gen- i ask this question genuinely i'm not trying to promote mm. a political discussion would this be happening next year if there's a Labour government in power, would teachers still be going on strike if the, if the same offer was made to them? I don't think they would be. So that's why I think there is an element to this that is politicised. And I don't think it's right for the kids to be used as collateral damage on that. I personally think that if Starmer comes in, is he going to say, you know what, give teachers uh, an inflation level pay rise and give them restorative pay for all the years, the 14 years that they've suffered pay, uh, pay losses. But he's not going to do that because... He's presenting himself, as, and so is Rachel Reeves. They're pitching themselves as centrists who are fiscally responsible and who, are, who, have, a, who have a grasp of how severe the economic picture is. So it's not going to happen. So that's n- another reason why I feel this is kind of a, a crisis that's worsening and the disruption, disruption's worsening. And I don't think, I feel sorry for my colleagues who've gone on strike who probably won't get their payback. Um, and I feel even more sorry for the parents of kids who are taking time off work and losing paychecks and suffering even more in a cost of living crisis. Uh, we'll bring bring Alex back in. Alex, do, do you agree with Shivan that this that if Labour offered what's been currently offered, that realistically teachers probably would have accepted it? Um, no, no, I don't. But but to be honest, I think we're just getting into the realms of um, of gut assertion there, which is fine. Like, obviously, you're entitled to to your gut assertion about it and your instinct. Um, but we're just playing guesswork there. On the on the point about the wider economic situation, um, one thing I'd point out is that the Bank of International Settlements did a study about the impact of wages uh, on inflation across the European economies. Their figures showed that they either have no effect at the moment or a deflationary effect. So it's not it's not wages that are causing the inflation problem. Conversely, the FTSE 350 since 2019 have had a profit rise of 73 um, percent. So the people at the top uh, are having a massive rise and the people at the bottom are being driven further into the dirt. And this idea that like another sector of workers in the public sector has it worse than us. Um, I can agree with that. For example, I, I think nurses probably have it much more difficult than us have been for a much more harrowing experience in terms of dealing with the pandemic and so on. But what we don't want to do is encourage a race to the bottom. Uh, it's not the case that one sector of workers having a hard time means everyone else should also have a hard time. Um, the point is, all of us should be pushing for a decent standard of living uh, and for public services to be respected. I also want to, can I pose one direct question uh, to you, Siobhan, about the about the strike? Of course you can. Go ahead. Cool. Um, so, again, I, I think absolutely we share this this worry about disruption, don't we? Um, and all teachers share that. Everyone's end goal on both sides of this debate uh, is the welfare of the children in school. And I accept uh, that each strike day is going to damage their welfare in terms of their access to education, um, like the coronation day did as well, to be fair. And no one ever mentions this, um, but damage does take place. My question would be, in five years' time or so, uh, if this hasn't been resolved, and people are still continuing to leave the profession and we're still continuing to miss our recruitment targets. Um, what are we going to say to the cohort that have gone through from year seven to year 11 there with things getting worse and worse and worse? I mean, we're already spending nearly a billion pounds a year on supply cover because of the shortage of teachers. Uh, education is getting increasingly fragmented and patchy uh, in terms of the lived experience of our pupils in schools. And it's going to get worse unless we arrest this situation now. And the only means to do that is strike action. It's going to get worse. 
So in terms of the moral duty uh, that we have to safeguard their welfare, wouldn't you, wouldn't you say, Siobhan, that we have to zoom out a little bit? In the immediate term, we're going to do some damage to the cohort that's here right now. In the longer term, we'll do worse damage if we don't do it uh, because the schools are going to be driven into the ground by the crisis that we're in at the moment. I totally, totally don't accept that. Uh, can I come back on why I don't Yeah, go, that? go on, Siobhan. So firstly, I don't accept that because I think I don't accept the fact you can just brush off the fact that they've had already had five days of strike action, plus they've had the two and a half years of, of disruption. Um, I, I don't, for what it's worth, but I it, it, not it's not to brush it off. It's, it's not no, to brush me, it off. It's, it's to say that it'll be worse. Let me finish my point. The, the, larger sure. point. the larger point is that people funding per head is now going back to 2010 levels. So there's 2010 levels, then the Tories take, take power, uh, Per, per people levels of funding plummets and now it's recovered back to where it was it was recovering by 2024 25 so funding is getting better it's improving um costs are going down for schools so the argument that 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 in five years time you know schools will be in this state of crisis isn't necessarily accurate and i think that the, the funding of schools isn't as bleak as has been suggested so i don't i don't kind of accept that um as I've said before, and we're kind of going back a little bit to what we talked about earlier, I'm not convinced that the reason that teachers leave the profession is rooted in pay. I think it's, I think it's down to do with really poor behaviour in schools across the country. I think it's to do with um, some SLTs insisting on a really unreasonable workload. I think it's to do with the amount of admin and kind of marking tasks that are kind of onerous and um, soul-destroying. I don't think that I think pays a factor. I'm not saying it's not a factor, but it's. I think there's so many other issues um, in 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 kind of teacher well-being and, and teacher satisfaction aside from pay. Shiva, with that in mind, would you support if if it was legally viable and possible? Would you support a strike over workload? No, because I don't think I don't think strikes are the answers. I would I would if there was a protest on Saturday to go down to, to Trafalgar Square and protest against. Uh, you know, workload for teachers or behaviour in schools. I'd be there. I don't think we should be striking because the kids are the ones who are harmed when you strike. It's it's I, I, it's not fair for that for that COVID generation to be the ones bearing the brunt of all of this. That's why I don't think. For me, I, I don't know when that when this when this generation will kind of I, to answer your question about when I think it's appropriate to strike is hard because I think this mm. generation are so badly affected and. and there were kids in year three at primary school and year 11 at secondary school who have all missed huge amounts of education. So it's not the case I can say this is the exact date in the future where strikes will be acceptable. And I'm not also saying for all it's worth that I, I'm not critiquing individual teachers for going on strike. For the most part, uh, I have colleagues at my school who go on strike and they, they're doing so for reasons that are, you know, um, you know that I would applaud, applaud. I don't disagree with them. I just disagree. I disagree with a bigger picture but I, I don't think that they're wrong or that they're immoral or, or negligent in any way um i do think these strikes are poorly timed i think that they are hitting the poorest kids worst i think they're exacerbating so many crises in education um and i do hold a lot of contempt for, for, and i'd be specific for the leadership of the enemy in particular um because you, you say you know this about this thing about julian keegan not negotiating well if, if the enemy are constantly going on strike um I can kind of sympathise. I think she's been a strange um, Secretary of State compared to some of the previous ones. I personally don't think she's done a very good job. I think she, she should be more vocal, she should be more present, uh, and she should be talking to us uh, unions. But I think she's, she's become this kind of lightning rod that is actually perhaps not fair given... I mean, as an example, the NEU claimed that um, the government has failed to provide adequate information on funding. The... Um, OSI have said that that's not true. The government did provide adequate information on funding. They just need to make it clear when they talk about being fully funded, they're talking about national averages rather than individual schools. So I feel like there's been a narrative against her in particular, but against the government that is playing, that, that, that the NU are using as part of a wide, as I said before, as part of a wider political strategy that I think is, is largely to do with an anti-Tory sentiment. I'll bring Alex in in a second on that if he wants to, but I, I want to ask, Siobhan is we do know though as you've already acknowledged is I understand everything you've just said I get it but we, we the fact is that teachers compared to all other public sector workers have had the worst deal when it comes to pay so 
are you saying that you know are you, are you saying it, the job the because of the job that teachers do which isn't their fault but you know they that they, they are in that job they're in a job that they wanted to do but it's not there for it's like saying oh it's uh, I, I don't know what I'm trying to say. I I, I, I know what you mean. To... What, what, so I so I so I can be, try and be a bit clearer because I feel like I've waffled a little bit. I'm sure your listeners agree. I think when the economic conditions are better, so when there's when there's better growth projections, when we're not kind of wavering on the brink of recessions, when inflation has come down, I think you have to then look at then revisiting more uh, revisiting to pay for more experienced teachers. Um, so when the times are good, you can you can you can spend, you can borrow, you can you can you can invest. The times are not good um, at the moment, and I think that's what, what I said earlier about the, the massive mistake the Tories made was austerity in the in the first place. Because I think that's it was it was a political choice, it wasn't necessary, and now we're paying the cost for that. Um, so I think when and if we can get growth rates above the anemic levels we're seeing right now. Um, when inflation comes down to something that's, that's much more sustainable, not as volatile as, as it currently is, um, that's when I think we can revisit uh, and look at these kind of um, historic pay injustices, or however you want to put it, and think about um, res- restoring pay for, for more experienced teachers with lost pay, um, et cetera, et cetera. I, I know it's not exact, an exact date. Um, I'm, that's not an exact line in the sand. It might not even happen. But that would be my response to. But are you saying because obviously we're talking about students aged between what three and nineteen? Yeah. So you're saying we basically need to wait for twenty years? No, no, no. That's what I'm saying. That's not what I'm saying at all. But they were all affected by COVID. Yeah. So so when when (laughs) there'll be twenty years before they're out of education? Yeah. I like I said, you asked me at the beginning of the show, do I agree with striking? And I think yes, I do in principle. And it depends on the context of when the strikes happen and what they're being what what they're being arranged over and i don't think mm. in this particular context it's it's in my view it's not justifiable um i think it's deeply harmful as i said before so i i know these i i'm trying not to sound like a politician and give you kind of uh, vague answers no it's okay but, i appreciate no, no, it. I, it's, it's, it's a tricky issue and particularly you know when you're a lone voice and you know you are in very much in the minority you have to really consider your your your, your arguments no, and I really appreciate you coming on, Siobhan, because I think no, no, that's, no. I think, and that's the point of what we do at Teachers Talk Radio as well is 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 bring in is we want to bring in different opinions, different voices. We want a diversity of opinion. So thank you very much for coming on, and sharing it. I do want to ask you on your list of things you have said a lot, and one of the key things that you saw within your argument is that a lot of schools didn't, and this is quoting you, a lot of yeah, schools yeah. did not offer much in the way of education during the lockdowns. Lockdown, lockdown, singular. First lockdown, sorry. Lockdown First singular. lockdown. And people seem to forget that. Yeah. Now, yeah. now, <sighs> they did try. I, I don't know if I agree with that, though. Sure. I, 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 because, I mean, I was teaching on a contract during that time. Um, online, I mean, yeah, I might let Alex come in on that actually before I do because I want to think about my sort of questions and comments on it. Alex, do you have anything to say on this idea that a lot of schools did not offer much in the way of education during the first lockdown and people seem to forget that? This program has been brought to you by the Happy Confident Company. Our clinically approved, ready to go well being and mental health program will help your pupils thrive. In only 10 minutes a day, you'll be able to deliver social and emotional learning and well-being tools throughout your school. To find out more, visit us at www.happyconfident.com. Um, it's not an issue I have a hugely developed opinion on. I would say yeah. schools did their best. Uh, you know, we were plunged into a pretty novel situation of a global pandemic um, and and they did their best. It's probably correct to say um, that our early efforts didn't match our later ones, but that's kind of to be expected. Um, again, it was a, a new situation and people were handling it kind of as it came. Uh, and I would say probably the quality of that improved massively with time. Um, is it okay to come back on a couple of the other bits from before? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, so about the issue of uh, we're not in good economic times, so we can't do it. I want to go back to my own school and the example of the early closure on Thursday. This was before the pandemic. This was before the inflation crisis. This was before all of it. Um, And we'd already gone through, um, as Siobhan, to be fair to him, acknowledged the 9% uh, per head pupil funding. So the funding cuts were already there and they already weren't listening. We're already in, what are we, like the sixth or seventh richest country in the world. 
and we're having to shut the school early uh, to keep the lights on. You know, th- this was already there. Um, so in good times, uh, in, in air quotes, this was already the situation uh, and it demanded a response from the profession. On the idea that we're now in such dire straits that there's nothing we can do about it, I just want to reiterate something I said earlier. So the Bank of International Settlements did their study of European economies and wages and said wages are not a contributing factor to inflation. In fact, if anything, they negatively affect the figures. So they're deflationary uh, and it's actually profit that's caused the inflationary crisis. Again, that's that about the FTSE 350. They're up 73% since 2019. So if anything, it's the people at the top that are driving this. And that's why it's a mistake. Um, I, I even think it's a mistake to point out that teachers might have had it particularly bad compared to another sector of workers. The point is all of us, all ordinary people, are to some extent in the mark um, because of wealth concentration at the top. That's the way around we've got to view this. Yeah, The country's stuffed with wealth. We can easily afford um, to redress the funding crisis if the political will is there. Um, and one more just quick point. I think we might actually find a bit of agreement on this. I agree with both of you that pay is not the only issue. Obviously, it's the issue that the strike is about. Um, in terms of retention, I would say I would agree with Siobhan that workload and behaviour um, are serious issues. One point about Gillian Keegan and the, the government's role in this, I know we haven't largely focused on them. In their negotiation, along with the £1,000 and the below inflation offer, they also tabled some uh, suggestions for how they might go about dealing with workload um, and behaviour. Those are now off the table because we rejected that offer and they said they won't offer it again. So this is this is punitive. You know, they've tried to take revenge on us effectively by saying, well, we won't sort out your workload issue um, because you spurned our offer. Um, maybe that's something all three of us can agree uh, as a negative approach to the negotiations. By the way, if anybody else wants to call in, and share your opinion one way or another, because that's what all this is all about, then just hit the little icon in the bottom left-hand side that's got the little microphone symbol on it. If you want to get involved and share your view or opinion or, or pose a question, perhaps, then you absolutely can do that. Shivan, do you want to come back on what Alex has said there? Um, oh, so it was an echo then. That was my own voice. So I think that... I, I think taxes on the rich will have to go up but again it's a question of how you do it which loopholes you close i still i don't i still don't buy the argument that it's just purely down to to um political choice i think we are as a country in a dire economic state um the argument about inflation pushing up uh, sorry wages pushing up inflation i think you know there's lots of debate about the cause of the inflation and why it's so much worse in the uk i mean whether it's purely supply side or whether it's down to increased demand and not enough, you know, too much money take, chasing too few goods, etc. Um, I can understand from the government's perspective why they are reluctant to give any sector an inflation level pay rise purely because of the fact it might send a signal for other private sector workers to do the same. Um, and I think there is also going back to that question of budgeting and, and, and the budget that the school department are dealing with, that budget isn't going to go up anymore so i think that, that they are they are kind of operating within budgetary constraints in that sense as i said before i i think if things improve um if the next government or this government look at rebalancing budgets for different departments potentially there, there'll be the political will and and the ability to to increase um the funding to something like the NAU you'd like to see but i don't think it's very, very realistic uh, frankly um so that would be kind of my response to to what Alex was talking about. I, I, in terms of his individual school, I, again, I don't. This is the thing about the, the, the average idea. You know, the, the, this this funding offer is affordable on average. There are schools that can't afford or won't be able to afford that. Um, what, you know, what I don't know the, the context of why a school would have to close early on a Thursday, and whether you know, there's always a, there's always other choices. There's always there's always trade offs. There's always opportunity costs. So whether there were other things that that school could have done in order to save money rather than you know close the school i don't know that's the issue with individual schools and individual budget pressures i mean i don't i can't comment on that i can comment broadly on on um you know the state of school funding Sh- generally shivan do you th- we've had a question here from ma um would you support individual schools striking against unreasonable management by slt I would, yeah, I would actually more more so than the yeah. I think that's I think that's a, I think that, I, I think that's a more reasonable thing to go on strike over. Interesting. Okay, um, but I mean that would still disrupt. The yeah, it would. But, but then it's a, that's a much. Think about. I mean, I can't remember the exact statistic off the top of my head, but it was something like 
was it was it 70 to 80 percent of schools were closed or you know partly open and open to maybe one or two year groups um for those five days I mean, the disruption is massive when you've got national strikes um and then obviously if there are more strikes in the summer term i think there's are they, are they doing three more i think uh, and then in the autumn term, there's going to be a coordinator strike. So if, if all schools across the country are going to be affected, obviously it's going to affect far more people. Um, individual schools striking against unreasonable management, you know, I think at least that's a, it's not going to affect as many people. It's not in any, like it's going to have a much smaller effect. Mm. Alex, what's your view on this, the, the idea of individual schools striking against unreasonable management by SLT? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, for that, if there's... Um... If there's abuses by SLT or if they're not handling the situation correctly and it gets to that extreme, uh, again, strikes are never the first port of call. Like, no one wants to do it. It's something that you're backed into uh, if everything else appears like it's going to fail. But I think the one thing that's notable about the current national dispute is that it's really nothing to do with school management. In fact, they've managed to unify all of the grassroots teachers with school management across the country, across all these unions for the first time. Uh, and that is indicative of something. Um, I know I, I take Chavan's point that he can't comment on my individual school and its budget decisions. But if we've got a situation where 92% of the NH, NAHT uh, head teacher members are saying they don't have the headroom in the budget to be able to afford the below inflation pay rise, the pay cut, um, that that speaks to something. Um, again, but, you, you but know, none, none, of us, none of us are sort of fully, that. none of us Sorry. are kind of fully expert enough to get right into the weeds and pronounce with absolute confidence on that. What we can point to is the practical reality that the people across the sector in these positions are experiencing, me at my individual school, and then all of those NAHT members that responded in that way. Sorry, Alex, I keep interrupting you. It's my phone's got a bit of a lag. Um, no worries, though. Echo as well. I was just going to say that's so the IFS, as I said earlier, the IFS have stated that it's affordable on average. So, but, so I don't know how 90% of teachers, the head teachers, saying that obviously doesn't correspond to what what the NAHT members are saying but the, the IFS who I would trust over that to be honest have said it's affordable on average and obviously that means there'll be some schools individually that can't afford it um, so I would go with them um, and like it's, we, we've already mentioned how these independent bodies are kind of not backing the government but they are certainly saying that the government were more clear and more sincere in their approach than I think the unions are letting on. Also, Shivan, the, the sort of because we've talked about some of the issues within the profession at the moment. I mean, would you would you agree it's sort of hitting crisis point in terms of the numbers, in terms of vacancies, in terms yeah. of the recruitment and retention? I mean, are we at crisis point? I think I think that's I think I think there was lots of different crises in education. So I think yes, retention of staff. Yes, in terms of recruitment. Um, yes, in terms of behaviour across schools. Yes, in terms. I mean, let's can we? I didn't mention this, but I should mention this. You know. Um, at the moment, 20% of students are persistently absent, one in five. That, that means they have less than 90% attendance at school. That is a massive crisis. That is going to result in lost, le lost learnings in the future. It's going to result in social issues. Um, it's going to have a much a more, it's going to have a hugely profound uh, you know, impact in society that you have that number of kids not turning up to school. So there are so many crises in education, and, and that's definitely the feeling that I get, that, that, that schools are in crisis. And my point would be that strikes are just making that crisis worse and not necessarily getting the, the, the gains that, they, that they're seeking. I suppose there would be those who would say that missing a few days for a strike action or drastically underfunded and understaffed schools, that, that's what some people would, would present it as. And I would say that would be fine if funding wasn't going back up to 2010 levels. If, if it was the case that we, I was looking at a, a graph where there was just a slide from 2010 down to now, but it's not, it's going back up. And much as I think we need a change of government, and we desperately, I think we desperately do, I think the, the Tories are so out of ideas and they've been in power for too long. But you can't look at the graph of, of school, school funding and, and look at the, the, the upward trend and, and ignore that. So if the trend is going upward back to what it was in 2010, and let's hope that it continues that way, then, then that's, not, that's not the reality. Shivan, Alex, absolute. Great chat. Thank you very much both for, for coming on. Um, it's been a real pleasure and we probably could have gone on for a lot longer on that. Um, maybe maybe there'll be another time. Who knows? Um, but thank you very much to both of you um, for coming on. And uh, and yeah, that, that was Teachers Talk Radio, The Late Show. Um, you'll be able to listen back to this uh, on the same link that you've listened to it on. And we'll probably also make it available as a podcast at some point via your podcast apps, whether that be Spotify or Apple Podcasts or 
wherever you get your podcasts. Do give us a follow on those and leave a review if you feel so inclined and tell us we are great. Go on, do it. Do it, please do it. Um, but that would be brilliant. And um, and also thank you uh, for listening. Special shout out to all the listeners today. Peter, Gareth, uh, right in the schoolies. Uh, thank you for listening throughout. Uh, English uh, teacher is here. Ma, who contributed the question. Samuel's been here throughout and every other listener too. We really appreciate you getting involved. Oh, and Mr. Lockett as well. And Mr. Das. Don't want to forget you two guys either. So thank you very much. And we will be back. And thank you, Nathan, for admining. And we will be back tomorrow on TTR. You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.